Welcome everyone to the press briefing by the Science Media Center Germany. My name is Iris Prof. We are currently in a global food crisis. So the food price index is as high as it ever was before. And this is mostly felt by vulnerable countries. So poor countries who rely a lot on food imports and who are heavily affected by climate change already. Now, the reason for this uh, global food crisis is an unfortunate combination of, of factors. Most salient uh, for us in Europe might be the Ukraine war through which large amounts of grain and fertilizer are missing on the world market. But there's also the effects of the COVID pandemic. There are high energy prices around the world and severe droughts that are happening in different places of the world at this moment. Um, now, this is a global problem, clearly a global issue. Why do we focus on East Africa? Now, there's a couple of reasons that make the situation there especially worrying. So there's an intense drought happening around the Horn of Africa. So here we're talking about Kenya, Somalia, Ethiopia. Um, there, the fourth rain season in a row has been far too dry and it's coming to an end now. And this has uh, heavy implications for agriculture. At the same time, these countries depend a lot on food imports, depend a lot on the World Food Programme by the UN, which also at this time doesn't have enough financial means and not enough food to supply people with even basic food supplies. Then we have a war going on in Ethiopia since 2020. And all of these factors combined um, lead to around 20 million people at this moment who are in a crisis state of hunger in Kenya, Somalia and Ethiopia. Now, we also want to include the country of Sudan into um, our focus here. It's a neighboring country to Ethiopia, but it's more northern. It has quite a different climate and different rain seasons. It's, it's part of the Sahel zone, so the beginning of the Sahara. It's very, very dry. Um, and it's also a country that depends a lot on food uh, imports from Ukraine and Russia, and a country where there hasn't been a good harvest in the last three years. So also there, the situation is, is quite severe. Now, we definitely could have similar discussions about other region, regions of the world that lack stable food systems that are heavily affected by war and by climate change, such as Yemen, Afghanistan or West Africa. Now, all of these regions, they need more short term help in terms of food aid. Um, but what we want to focus on today is uh, long term solutions to the problem. So how can East Africa develop stable food systems that are independent from the global market and that are resilient against droughts, which are becoming more and more frequent with climate change? And how can the global north help and should the global north help in this transition? Now, a little note to the journalists out there, a video recording of this um, discussion will be online still today and a written transcript you can find on our website from on next week, Tuesday. Now I'd like to introduce our four experts here. I'm very grateful and thrilled that you four are here with us today. Um, so we have Dr. Noah Adamte, who is a researcher at the Institute of Organic Agriculture in Switzerland, and he is coordinating a project in Kenya that compares organic and conventional farming. We have Professor Dr. Christian Borgemeister, who is executive director of the Center of Development Research at the University of Bonn in Germany. He worked as a researcher previously in Kenya for around eight years. His specialty is uh, insects and pest control, but he has brought knowledge about sustainable agriculture across the African continent. We have Dr. Kathleen Hermans, who is a researcher at the Leibniz Institute of Agricultural Development and Transition Economies in Halle, Germany, as of this week. And um, she previously studied environmental change and migration so a little bit of a different aspect um, in Ethiopia. And we have Dr. Oliver Kirui, who is a researcher at the International Food Policy Research Institute in Khartoum, Sudan. He grew up in a farmer's family in Kenya, so he has some firsthand experiences of what we're talking about today. Um, and he has researched agriculture and land degradation in different African countries, including Kenya, Ethiopia, and Sudan now. Thank you very much for being here with us today. My first question goes to Christian Borgemeister. So in Ethiopia and Kenya, around 70% of the population works in agriculture. Still, these countries depend a lot on food imports, also outside of the acute crisis right now. Why is that? Why can't they feed themselves? Mm, 
Thank you, Ms. Prof. Um, I think at the heart of it is a combination of three major factors. We have on one hand, we have um, a tremendous demographic growth in, in Africa and also in these three countries uh, that you have mentioned. Um, uh, I'm presently in Ibada, Nigeria, so on the western side of the continent. If you take the example of Nigeria, Nigeria presently has approximately 200 million um, inhabitants forecasted for 2100, 800 million. So demographically speaking, Africa and South Asia are the last great frontiers of population growth on this planet. Um, second, in, you have stagnating yield levels of all major crops in Africa. They have been basically running flat over the last 15, 20 years. So we haven't made any progress in increasing yields of major agricultural commodities in Africa, in sub-Saharan Africa, I should uh, qualify, contrary to the situation, say, in Asia or in Latin America, where yields uh, of the key commodities have been uh, uh, steadily increasing. And last but not least, this is what you just mentioned, we are having more and more impact of, um, of climate variability, of extreme climate events as the, the current drought in, uh, in, in East Africa. And all these three factors are interlinked and exacerbate each other. So as long as we don't tackle all these three issues, as long as we are, are not addressing demography, as long as we are not addressing these dismally low yield levels, and as long as we are not really starting to act upon climate change, and there the North has a, a great responsibility uh, in this respect, we are not going to see change. On the contrary, we're going to see the situation further aggravating. Back to you. Thank you very much. Second question goes to Oliver Kirui. Now we heard a little bit about the background situation. Um, let's focus on the acute situation now. So how are the food systems in East African countries currently affected by the Ukraine war, by the COVID pandemic and the drought? I think you are muted. Maybe you can unmute yourself. There you go. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for your question. Uh, um, Ms. Prof. Prof. Um, and as following up on what um, Professor Pogemaster just mentioned a little moment ago, uh, the countries in the Eastern African region, the Horn of Africa or East African region, so I, or include, including Sudan to make it the Horn of Africa, they're experiencing the worst drought in, in, in 40 years. Um, there have been three or four consecutive seasons that have been very dry. And on the occasions when rain, rain has, 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 has come, it has been very extreme. We've seen also several other issues that follow that, like locust um, the locust outbreak and, and, and further challenges also associated with climate change. If, if you look at um, the statistics and also the reality on the ground is that the last um, four, three or so seasons, millions of, of farmers have lost their crops. They have also lost their livestock because of, 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 of this very extreme dry season. And um, at the backdrop of this, uh, the Ukraine crisis uh, added another layer of challenges to what already was, was, was becoming a huge problem in the region. And if I may be very specific, for example, if you look at um, the food security situation in Sudan, there's been a soaring acute food insecurity, and this is uh, aggravated by, I would say, a combination of many factors. So there's drought, which I just mentioned. There is COVID-19 that the country has been trying to recover from. And then there is low production of key stable crops, and, and this has happened also for over, over many, many seasons. There is the political instability. As many of you would know now, Sudan is, 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 is under a military rule, and, and this has also disrupted production, and, and, and this, 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 this is another layer of challenge to, to the ongoing issues that, are, that Sudan is facing. And then we have, I would say, another factor that is the conflict in Ukraine. So um, if you look more generally, more uh, the recent estimates that we have from the, uh, the FAO is that um, about 11 million people or close to 30% of the Sudanese population would need life-sustaining support in the year 2022. And, and the number is the highest in, in, in the last decade. 
And uh, we cannot underestimate the significance of, of, of Russia and Ukraine in the African agriculture, and it's particularly for Sudan and, and the other neighboring countries. So uh, Russia, if you look, for example, in terms of main stable for Sudan, wheat, wheat, is, wheat is the second most important food for Sudan and, and only after sorghum. And you see that only 15% of the total supply is from domestic production, 85% which is about 2.5 to 3 million tons is imported wheat. And this is particularly uh, from Russia and from Ukraine. So the, the recent issues in the, in the, in the, in the Black Sea region has a major implication on, on, the, on the situation here in, in Sudan. If, if, if I may put one number in perspective here is that Sudan has seen an increase in prices uh, of wheat. Currently the local wheat price is at about $550 per ton. This is about 180% increase compared to the same time period last year. And basically this increase could be attributed to the challenges that are, that are happening in, um, in, in Ukraine and also in, 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 in the global market surrounding the wheat, wheat trade. And perhaps a final point on this is that uh, Russia is a key producer of fertilizer. Many farmers in Sudan, and I know in Kenya as well, have had very difficult times uh, receiving fertilizer this year. And, and this, this has really affected the amount of land that has been put under cultivation. In Sudan, we've, we've done a little bit of survey and we've, we, we find that about 40% of what was planted last year is what has been put into cultivation this year. So we're anticipating there will be a huge food, 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 food crisis in the coming months, given that the total production would be, would be much lower than what, what is anticipated. Back to you, thank you. Thank you. These are really shocking numbers you've been mentioning there right now. Now the next question goes to Noah Adamte. So we've heard from both Mr. Borgemeister and Mr. Kirui about the problem of low production that we also have in these countries. Now this is exactly what you are researching. Um, what would you recommend to farmers in Kenya who want to increase the productivity of their crop farming? You are muted. Thank you indeed the stagnation and low productive capacity of the farms in East Africa is an issue. And this is what we have identified for the past 14 years, working on the long-term trial and also working with farmers on different, in different regions and areas. The average nutrient input per year is of, at the moment, around 45 to 50 kilograms per hectare for nitrogen and that of 60 kilogram of phosphate fertilizer. And this we have observed that it could not help in meeting the nutrient need of the crop to increase their capacity. We also observe majority of the farms, which uh, is composed of the smallholder farmers use rainfelled agriculture and with the drought challenges and the climate change impact that has been mentioned is affecting this productivity. Last but not the least, the pest and disease incident is also a major issue. So from our trial, after 14 years, we observed that the existing practice, as I have just mentioned, would not be able to turn the wheel. In the last three years, we try to diversify the farming system. When I mean diversifying the farming system, we try to include other crops that can serve in managing pests and diseases, including the IPM, the Integrated Pest Management Technologies. We also in increase the nutrient level be be beyond the existing practice to more sustainable practice. And we try to improve on water harvesting technologies. By so doing, we have increased the yield in both organic and conventional by 50%. So we saw that that would be the way out for farming systems in East Africa to be resilient against climate change impact, in this case, drought and that of pest and disease incident. So diversification of the farming system and also selection of crops because we are working in different areas. 
based on the soil as well as that of uh, rainfall amount differences. There is the need for guidance in the selections of crops, which crop will be able to survive and be able to grow well in a given region. And if this is done in conjunction with the diversification, it will be very helpful. The next issue is the soil fertility. For the past 14 years, we saw that this system that I have described as the system of the small scale farmers uh, could not improve soil fertility the health and even carbon. On the other hand, in the high input system, like that of organic, where we have been using organic input of an average of about 15 tons per hectare, we have been able to improve soil fertility after three years and soil health and build soil carbon between six to 14 years. And this has helped to increase the productivity of the farms. So there is, a, there is the need for a paradigm shift from our soil fertility management through the traditional use of fertilizer alone because most areas, the soils are so poor and acidic that they are no longer responding to fertilizer application. The input, uh, organic input use is a challenge and therefore there will be the need for livestock integration, promotion of livestock so that a lot of manure can be generated, which can be used as another input means to uh, management of the soil fertility or soil health. Then uh, one issue is information. We have also observed from one of our studies, which we have done for the past six years, that information reaching farmers are uh, ending up either diluted or not in their right package form. And therefore, if we want to increase productivity of small scale farmers, which contribute about 72% of the total uh, of GDP uh, of agriculture production in the East Africa, then there will be the need to revisit our extension system. There will be the need to link up the activities of the NGOs in the agriculture sector. There will be the need to harmonize all the actors in the agriculture uh, food chain so that information reaching farmers will be well packed as it is from the source. Finally, but not the least, market as an issue. It has an influence on farmers productivity and this if addressed can help increase their productive capacity of the farms thank you thank you mr adam tay there were a lot of interesting points i would like to get back to later on but first i would like to introduce um our fourth expert here kathleen hermans do you expect that more frequent droughts will make regions in east africa uninhabitable and that large numbers of people will leave these regions permanently yeah, thanks, Ms. Prof. It's, it's always difficult to estimate at what point certain regions become actually uninhabitable, and not just for East Africa. But it's a matter of fact that rural livelihoods in East Africa get increasingly under pressure. So, for example, in Ethiopia, it's fast areas of the highlands, it's fast areas of the lowlands. So, basically, those regions are part of the recent regions that are also affected now by the drought. And there's an urgent need to deal with these stresses to secure the livelihoods. So in East Africa, migration is a, is a typical risk-reducing strategy and can be a solution to secure income. And in 2018, the World Bank has um, published a major report, the Groundswell Report, with a focus on uh, Ethiopia. And there they estimated for, there they estimated up to 1.5 million people uh, could be displaced internally, so within the country by the year 2015. So, and last year there were 250,000 internally displaced people um, counted in Ethiopia. So that is a, would be a major increase of those numbers, just because of natural disasters. So not just droughts, but all kinds of natural disasters, including floods and others. 
we have to be very cautious with those quantitative estimates of future migration numbers because um, they come with very high uncertainties. High uncertainties related to climate change consequences, by high uncertainties particularly related to how do people actually respond in terms of migration or staying put um, uh, as a consequence of climate change. But there is no doubt that extreme events like droughts will increase migration and displacement drastically. Um, but there's also scientific consent that climate change doesn't push people around uh, the entire globe. So it's mainly people who are leaving their homes because of climate change or because of extreme events. They are, they're moving within their own country, they move across uh, short distances, they mainly move from rural to urban, uh, from rural to urban areas. Um, but it's not that people moving around the globe. That's a, that's an idea that's often, yeah, that we often get from the media, but it's uh, something that we haven't observed so far. Thank you very much. Um, now I'd like to ask Mr. Kirui and Mr. Borgemeister, um, so we heard from uh, Noah Adam Tay a couple of strategies that farmers could use to, for example, diversify the crops they they use to integrate animal farming into um, into crop farming to use manure as a fertilizer. Um, what do you think of these strategies, and how could they be actually put into practice to increase productivity? I don't know who wants to go first. <laughs> Oliver, you go ahead. Okay, thank you, thank you, Prof. Um, I, I think I agree with, with the suggestions there. And, and, and I think over years, and from my research on the economics of land degradation and looking at the cost of land degradation in East Africa, what we found out is similar to, 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 to what Adam Jaya just mentioned today, that um, what, what, what has been experienced over time is soil mining. So the soil fertility is, is, is a huge, it's a huge uh, uh, issue for, for many, many small scale farmers. And trying to improve that soil fertility would be a good thing. And, and I believe that um, uh, over dependence on fertilizer may not be the solution. We may have also to think beyond the inorganic fertilizer to also move to organic fertilizer. And, and, and but I think at the very, short and the medium term, we need to improve the fertility of that soil so that farmers are able to harvest at least some food to, to, to consume. Um, but but I, would, I would shift a little bit to, and look into the potential innovations or potential um, the technologies that could also shift the productivity of most of the farms in the region, Kenya and Sudan, and even Ethiopia in this case. And, and this, this is efficient irrigation systems. If you look at the potential for, for irrigated agriculture in our region or in these countries is very huge, but, but low, not enough investment has been put into irrigation system. So efficient irrigation technology, energy, energy saving technologies would be, would be a plus. Many countries in the region depend a lot on diesel powered generators. What, why, why, not, why not solar, solar generator or solar powered um, uh, technologies that could, could really be good for climate, but also very efficient in terms of, of, of water utilization and water, water harvesting. Uh, and I, I would also think that um, the ultimate for all efforts that we, we are doing must be really building a more resilient agriculture and food system for, for the entire of this country. So besides providing inputs for the resource poor and vulnerable communities, we need to develop and expand the, the agriculture and climate research and extension services. Most of the countries, Sudan being one of those, is very poor when it comes to extension services to farmers. Most farmers need the technology and the, the knowledge on what to produce the diversification that, that, that Noah mentioned a few moments ago, they need information on this, what works where and what works better under what condition. So extension services would be needed. So we need also to, to, to talk about alternatives. As, as I mentioned, moving out on over dependence on one, one crop. If, 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 if wheat is, 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 for example, the major stable in, in the food systems, and then there is a Russia, uh, Ukraine conflict going on, and this brings everything almost to an halt or increase prices three or four times. This is not sustainable. So we need to think beyond wheat dependence to more other resilient crops and, and other crops like sorghum, millet, and, 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 and other crops, but also think of high value commodities that could also go to the export market so that it brings employment to the young people, but also foreign exchange earnings to, to the country. 
yeah let me let me chip in a little bit on this um um Noah made very, very good points here. Uh, anybody in agriculture would know it starts with the soil. Um, the soil is, is basically the fundament of agriculture. And Africa, geologically speaking, has the oldest soils on this planet. They are, if you want, by definition, already nutrient depleted. And building up the strength, the, 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 the health of soil, this is, a, uh, this is like a generational task. And um, I, I totally agree both with Noah and, and Oliver. We need mixed approaches here, uh, which would include both organic as well as uh, mineral fertilizer to improve. We have to keep in mind that um, the vast majority of the agricultural growth that we've seen in Africa over the last couple of years has been by, by expansion of area of arable land. And this is meaning we are expanding into areas that are forests, that are uh, crucial savannas. So we are we are basically destroying through this agricultural expansion. We are destroying the last hotspots of biodiversity in Africa. So there is no question whatsoever that the agriculture needs to be intensified. The, the yields have to increase. But this starts, as I said, as Noah said, as Oliver said, this starts from the soil. Water is the next point. Um, um, if you look at uh, Asian agriculture, about 55% of Asian agriculture is irrigated. I think, Oliver, correct me if I'm wrong, the, the current figures in Africa are between 4 and 5%. So there's a huge potential, there's a huge potential for, for, um, for irrigated agriculture. And obviously, with increasing droughts, if you irrigate your crops, be it through um, uh, basically tapping into groundwater with solar-powered pumps, something that is hugely popular in India, technologies that are there, that are on the shelf, that are actually inexpensive, they are ready to use in Africa, or through clever ways of rainwater harvesting, utilizing the little rain that falls and keeping it throughout the growing period. Another very, very crucial intervention that makes agriculture also more climate resilient, that increases yields and makes agriculture more climate. Uh, climate resilient. And last point, the crops. Um, we have, in agricultural research over the last 50, 60 years, we have, uh, we've kind of um, pursued a one size fits all uh, model. I call it the maize model. Everything was maize, maize, maize. Yeah. Everybody was working on maize. Everybody was, was in, at least in terms of staple crops, was looking at how to improve uh, maize varieties, how to adapt them to more local conditions. Now, if you look at it from an African perspective, one has to keep in mind, mace is an invasive plant, if you want. Mace comes from Central America, was introduced to West Africa uh, by the Portuguese in the 16th century. In East Africa, much more recent introduction. Even. Now, there are crops, Oliver mentioned, sorghum and millet, there are staple crops that are much more adapted to dry conditions, but much less resources have been invested into improving varieties of millet, improving varieties of sorghum, make them stronger, yield, let them yield more. So if just a fraction of the resources that international plant breeding giants have invested into, uh, into various maize varieties, we would be in a, in a more resilient situation, having, having access to varieties of of crop species that are more adapted to this ever drying climate in many parts of Africa. Back to you, thank you. We have a question by a journalist that addresses uh, exactly that, that question. Um, and she asked also in that regards to Oliver Kirui, how come that there is this big wheat dependence that you mentioned in Sudan? And uh, would, would it be possible to get back to these traditional crops that Mr. Borgermeister also just mentioned, so sorghum, millet and other? Yes, so I think it's it's a very good question, and and it's it's also what we've been we've we've been paddling with the last few weeks and months. Now we've we've written some four studies that looked into the wheat value chain in Sudan, and 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 part of the part of the story in Sudan is that um, for many years um, the private sector involvement in wheat in terms of import and exportation and packaging and processing has been very very good, and therefore. If you go to the shops, for example, you find wheat and wheat products really, really available and ready and, 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 
and, and, and, and quite advertised. So the traditional crop, sorghum millet, it, it's a rural crop, it's a rural, it's a rural diet. So most urban consumers and most people in the cities and towns would not find packaged um, products in terms of, of, of this. So it goes into a lot into dietary uh, diversification, but also goes into nutrition and say, for example, a nutrition and, and diet education for, for, for many years. So the, the, as, as, as Christian mentioned a, little, a, a moment ago, um, we, 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 we need to go back into this and, and bring more in terms of education and more in terms of, 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 of promoting such crops and, and, and showing that the nutritional content in sorghum is not any far or any different uh, from, from wheat. And also looking at, in terms of resource uh, requirements to produce a ton of wheat and a ton and resource requirement to produce a ton of sorghum would, 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 be, would be lopsided. So it's much more efficient to produce sorghum and millet and perhaps in terms of nutrition, not very far apart from, 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 from wheat. So I would say, more and more of private sector involvement must be encouraged and supported to make sorghum and other related crops more available in the market and also in, 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 in products that are easily and easily farmers and, and consumers can easily associate with and buy. If I wanted a bread made from sorghum today and I went to the market, I wouldn't find it. But there, is, there will be different, maybe five or six or seven different types of breads on the same shelf made from wheat in, in, in the market. So if we need, we need to move slightly into this support and promote the private sector and encourage private sector to invest much more in producing products that also come from these this other, this other um, uh, crops and, and yeah. Thank you. I find it interesting that a lot of the solutions seem to also be related to education. No? One, both what you mentioned about education about nutrition and what Noah Demte mentioned in the beginning about education about farming practices. Um, now I'd like to broaden the view again a little bit and ask oh, for Hermans. Yeah. Yeah, maybe just to add, it's not just education, but it's also engaging the local communities and listening to them and um, considering their, their expertise and their, their knowledge. So we have often experienced that farmers were telling, okay, we, they get a certain, let's say, modern type of grain is uh, promoted, but they say, yeah, of course, we know they get a higher um, yield in principle, but their the adaptation or they're less suited for extreme uh, heat, for example, or low um, precipitation. But um, and we, we basically, we know better what type of uh, crops to use, uh, those traditional types, but uh, no one is actually really listening to us. And there's some, in some cases, there's even some sort of coercion to use uh, other grain types, to, to use other crop types, which are less uh, suited according to the farmer. So I think it's really crucial to, uh, yeah, to consider this knowledge and this experience from the local communities um, in addition to education. Thanks. We have a question by a journalist about exactly that uh, that aspect that you just mentioned. Are there local and countrywide institutions in the East African countries available and capable to manage agricultural transformation? I guess you need effective management and clear regulations to do so. I don't know who wants to answer to that. Maybe Mr. Burgermeister, I think. I start and then I pass on to Oliver. Uh, the, the, Take the example of Kenya. Kenya has a, a, a highly developed uh, agricultural research and extension organization. So uh, it's not lack of uh, capacity. And, and I would even say it's also not lack of resources. It's sometimes um, finding the appropriate solutions. Let me go one step back. Um, and coming to the, just a, a little footnote on this wheat situation, what is uh, um, becoming a very popular strategy is substitution. Um, you don't need to make a bread. Um, if you want to have a bread uh, with 100% wheat, you can substitute 20% of wheat with cassava flour that is locally produced. This is something that is happening a lot here in Nigeria, and that this is going to uh, uh, get a lot of traction. And this in reduces the dependency on the Ukraines and Russias of this world, and also reduces the food import bill of the respective governments. Oliver, over to you. Yeah, I, I agree that um, there are a number of institutions in our countries that could actually 
drive an agricultural transformation. But, but in terms of resource and, and in terms of their capacity, this, this is not in question that yes, capacity is there, but, but in terms of resources, in terms of how much allocation is given to these institutions, if you look at the current and recent estimations on how much money is put, for example, in agricultural um, sub -sect sector, how much is put into a science and agricultural um, research and, and, and extension, this is this is way below the, 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 the recommendations from, say, for example, the Malabo declaration that say 10% should go into agriculture from the budget and 1% at least go into research and, and extension. But the, many countries are not doing even, 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 even half of this. So we need their institutions, yes, but we need to, to move and public finances and public expenditure must improve in order to support say, for example, the scientists that are working in, in these sectors and also the other personnel that are promoting and taking the extension services to the, to the farmers. There are local level institutions, there are regional institutions, there are international organizations as well. If you look, for example, regional bodies and, and continental bodies like AGRA, the Green Revolution and, 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 and Alliance and, and others that, that are coming together to, to think and work and out solutions to transform agriculture in Africa, a new green revolution. There are many, there are many, many, many people and many institutions that are coming together to do this. But in terms of resources, I guess we need to do much more than that. This would not be successful without the involvement of private sector. Once you develop, for example, uh, a variety, public investment is put into developing seed variety. You need promotion, you need distribution, you need transportation, you need value addition. And this is not the work of government, this is the work of private sector. So policies and institutions must support the 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 the, the budding and also the the, the 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 strengthening of the existing private sector players so that they are able to 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 to, to improve the, 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 the link between production and consumption and make it more seamless and and the, the call chains for example to to to, to reduce post harvest losses this is the work of private sector and we need to to put much more effort into building this and maybe the last point linking to what Christian Bogemaster said before in terms of diversification and in terms of other players coming into play, for many years, maize security was almost synonymous with food security in some countries, particularly say Kenya, for example, because most of the resources and most of the public investment went into maize research and maize you know, promotion. Wheat is the same situation, say, in Sudan. So we have to be more careful on how public policies are crafted to move the story beyond one crop into more food systems and food, food systems approach where we are talking about much more than producing, also value addition and different crops and varieties at the same time. Thank you. I would like to broaden the, the view a little bit here and ask about um, who is actually most affected by the current situation. So the current drought and the current food uh, shortage, maybe a question for Ms. Hermans. Um, so is it more the, the farmers who now cannot farm anymore because there's a drought? Is it the pastoralists, so nomadic people moving around with their animals? Uh, or is it the urban population who is has a, the hardest time to adapt? It's probably both, also depending on the on the exact uh, location. It's definitely the rural farmers who are uh, yeah who are involved in crop in crop farming, but it's definitely also the pastoralists. Um, it's probably also, I don't want to say it's less, but it's probably to a different extend or different type to the uh, rural, uh, sorry, the urban populations, because they're facing completely different um, challenges, let's say. But it's, um, yeah, in the first instance, it's the farmers and uh, the pastoralists, yeah. Mr. Adam Tay, do you want to add to that? You are, you are muted. I think you can just keep your microphone on. Yes, I agree with what Ms. Herman just said. It affects both the pastoralists, the farmers, and also water scarcity to the vulnerable communities. And do you think that this, um, this nomadic lifestyle that we have in all of these East African countries in the part of the population, um, is that actually still sustainable facing uh, the challenges we have now? So the population growth and climate change. Very good question. Looking at the present practice whereby most of the livestock are on free grazing. Uh, research has indicated that uh, they are, the quality of the pasture they feed on 
is not good, which is affecting the meat quality as well as the uh, output in terms of productivity. So there should be the need to shift from the free grazing system into pasteurized production system, whereby farmers can have control on the kind of feed given to the livestock. And for that matter, they will, this will require infrastructure, capacity development, policies to support and to strengthen so that there will be a paradigm shift to this direction to enable the livestock resist the climate change impact we are experiencing now. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have a little um, question to something you said before, Mr. Kirui. Um, by a journalist, she asks, which private sector do you want to strengthen, the local or national or from abroad like, abroad like the Chinese? Yeah, every time we talk about private sector involvement, I think we, we have to be to be more open to options and variety. But I, in this case, I'm thinking about if, if you look at Sudan, for instance, that the, the international players have not been in this space for long because of sanctions and because of, say, for example, um, the challenges that, that, that followed the regimes that were here before. So private sector, in my, in my understanding, would be, of course, local investments and local investors but also if there are um, international investors that would bring for example if you talk about solar technology this may not be there may not be <clears throat> a local um, a local company or local institution that is able to do this perhaps we need cross-border kind of uh, uh, private sector linkages and, and networks so I wouldn't limit it to say, for example, to, 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 to local, local investments and local private sector, but I would say, yeah, of course, we need to build the local private sector, but also the involvement of the other players from solar, solar power suppliers, uh, in, from India, from China, from Germany, from Spain, and, and water pumps and solar energy and, and the different aspects, transportation, who, 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 who uh, call, call trucks and, and, and so forth. This, this may go beyond the local investors into an hybrid kind of network of investments. Thank you. Um, and we're already at the end of our time, so I would like to come to the last question, which is a very important one. So I'm curious um, what you will say. I would like to focus now on the, on the role of the Global North, as this is a, an event for, for European journalists. Um, what do you think, in which ways can the Global North help this this agricultural transition, Noah Adamte, you called it a paradigm shift multiple times. What can the noble global north do and what do you expect of the global north to do? Maybe Mr. Adamte, you want to start. Thank you. Um, I will categorize it in three main areas. One, support institutional building and strengthening among government, the private sector, and civil society. So that if the policy between, for example, European Union and that of African Union can be harnessed, such as, as EU is looking for green agriculture and has a percentage that by the year, in five years or 10 years, what they expect, if they can also link up with the counterparts in the African uh, countries, it will be very helpful. So to support these institutions and strengthen the government, the private sector. Then the second thing is strengthen capacity development. And this, I will categorize it into technical development, infrastructure development, technology development, and networking on local national, regional food systems. This will also go a long way to contribute in transforming the food system. Consideration should also be given to the supply chain. I mentioned already, and Oliver also mentioned it several times, to diversify the production system, the local value addition, the processing, improve aggregation, and distribution at different levels. So this is how strengthening capacity development through the te technical infrastructure and technology will help. And lastly, but not the least, 
greater support to contextual. And I would like to emphasize on this so much. Greater support to contextual and grassroots research to generate a compelling and convincing evidence across the different components of food systems. It will be very helpful if their support to research will be based on the grassroots. It will be more helpful. Thank you. But quick question about that. Like um, you are, for example, working on a project that's a collaboration between the European institution and Kenya. Um, do you think this is not happening enough or is this, this not exactly what you mean? This is one typical example and that is what Africa needs. You know, it's a long-term trial. And for example, it took us 14 good years to see a change in soil carbon buildup. Imagine the European partners got fed up and stopped funding this research. We wouldn't have been able to know that we can address the soil degradation problem and it comes at a point in time. So our long-term trial is a typical example to see how the greater support from the North in their contextualized approach is helping to come out with knowledge and procedures and guidelines that can help to rejuvenate and sustain agricultural production systems. Thank you. Same question to Ms. Hermans. What do you expect of countries of the global north? I think, first of all, a stable agricultural production requires a stable, or at least a predictable climate. Um, so in the accelerating climate change increasingly undermines such conditions. So obviously, the most urgent step to be taken by the global north is just to drastically cut CO2 emissions and to adhere to the Paris Agreement. It's, um, yeah, it's fighting the, the root cause, not just the symptoms. Um, the second point, and I mentioned that earlier already, is that whenever it comes to planning and implementing um, land restoration activities or any other initiatives to decrease the vulnerability of local people to climate change and extreme events, we need to account for the needs and demands of the local people. And uh, so local communities need to be actively involved from the start to consider their skills, their knowledge, their tradition, their culture, and to give them a voice in a decision um, making process. And this can result in solutions that lead to a more secure future. So when ignoring this, so when setting up typical bottom up approaches as they have done in the past, there's always a risk that those will fail, even if they come with lots of international uh, financial support. So international donors should actually request the engagement and empowerment of uh, local actors, of local communities, of women. Today, we haven't talked about the role of women at all. So women are actually the backbone uh, for local food production in, in East Africa. And um, then there's one point we haven't touched on this uh, today because it's, yeah, it's a very pro topic. It's just our agricultural policy of the European Union and also the US. I mean, we distort the African market. As long as the EU uh, or the Global North dumps highly subsidized products at the African markets, um, those products can't be produced by the local markets or by, uh, by other African um, yeah, countries. So this distorts the agricultural production and trade and it hampers the development of an, of an independent agricultural sector. So rather the domestic food production, as it was mentioned today, should be supported. But do so you also across... mean, sorry, quick question. Do you also mean food aid with that or? No, I don't mean food aid. No, I don't mean food aid. I really mean dumping subsidized um, products on the market. So removing agricultural subsidies in the north and introducing trade barriers in the south, um, that could increase the, yeah, the rural value adding. It's, um... Thank you very much. Same question to Mr. Borgermeister. What do you ex what do you expect from the global north to help in this situation in East Africa? Ma'am, I make it simple. A lot of money. This is going to cost a lot of money. This, this, these resources are needed um, to enable Africa to adapt to climate change. Um, and this includes um, a building up a more resilient um, food system. This includes restoration of land. We haven't talked about it. And we, with the current uh, set of arable land, we will not make the cut. So we need to claim back land. And this is possible. Oliver is an expert for this. This is possible, but it's hugely expensive. Now, 
if we look at the, our recent crisis, starting from the, the financial crisis in 2008 to COVID and now to the Ukrainian war, we got completely used to using trillion figures. So if trillion figures are needed, one, two, three, four, five, they appear and they are spent. These kind of similar numbers, these kind of similar investment is needed to stabilize uh, the, the environments in Africa, make them, make them adapt to climate change. In addition to what Ms. Hamas just said, of course, we need to, we in the North, we need to drastically cut our emissions. That's the root cause, obviously, but the genie is out of the bottle. So we need to enable uh, vulnerable regions of the world through large subsidies to adapt to a changing climate. And this includes um, uh, developing uh, resilient food systems. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, maybe controversial, quick question to that. Does this also benefit the global north or is this just, um, uh, how do you say that? Sorry, is this just giving money to help no, the poor people of Africa? Absolutely not, it's a win-win. It's a win-win. I mean, uh, ad adapting Africa to climate change, uh, um, um, helping them develop a, a sustainable food system is going to boost these economies tremendously, making them even more interesting business partners. Uh, economically speaking, Africa, wh why are the Chinese here? They're not only here uh, to extract the last gram of cobalt from African soils. They're also on the continent because it's a, it's it's the last big economic frontier. Uh, we are talking about uh, gazillions of customers that are interested in products that come from China as well as from the north. So, from an economic point of view, this is a very wise uh, wise and lucrative investment. So it's not. I'm not talking about charity. I'm talking about helping these societies to adapt to climate change and helping them to develop their economies. Um, to, to, and from this, we're gonna benefit in the North tremendously. Thank you very much. And same question lastly to Oliver Kirui, what do you expect from the Global North? Yeah, my colleagues have said almost everything that I've said. Maybe I'll put it in, in different words, but, but, but it's exactly the same thought lines here. So I think, my takeaway and what I would think the, North, the global North could do is really help in building a more resilient agricultural and food system in Africa and in East Africa and Sudan for that case, because this is where I am at the moment. And, and this would be very helpful in, in helping the households, you know, to giving the households the ability to better withstand future economic shocks that we've, that, like we've seen today. If I'm to, enumerate, uh, 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 to, to name a few of these, is, for example, we've talked about providing agricultural inputs to the resourceful and the vulnerable. And, and again, I, be, I agree with, with, with what my colleague said, starting from the bottom up, start from the, the, the very vulnerable, the households, the women, farmers, and also, you know, the resource poor and those that are very at the very margins of the society, the marginal environment, that, that, uh, that, that is very key. We start from the very um, vulnerable. What, what the Global North could also do is really support the efforts to investment into sustainable land management. We've seen that every dollar invested in, in, in land management and land reclamation brings back about $5 in return. So it's more lucrative to invest into SLM, sustainable land management practices. And, and in food security, as we said, I think there is an immediate problem that we must address, but in the long term, we need to, 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 to build the economic resilience of the, of, the, of the households. So not just access to food, but also the distribution. And this is where the private sector would come in. And this is where investment would come in. And also the economic power, the ability for the households to purchase their food, not just to produce. There is an aspect we didn't talk about, and it's very key supporting digitalization. You know, today we speak in Europe and we speak in the global north of robotics in farming. We're talking about the next, you know, I think we are in, you know, like we are 4.0 when it, when it comes to, 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 to technology. But in Africa, we are still moving from the handheld tools and, and now moving into appropriate mechanization, just use of tractors. This is where we are now. And, and not all farmers are able to even access. 70% of farms in Africa are still, still under the cultivation by hand or by animal 
animal drone implement. So appropriate technology, the digitalization, robotics. This, are, this is where we need to begin speaking. And, and for this, we need also education, we need uh, capacity, and we need, we need to train farmers and also to, 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 to support farmers. And finally, as we talked about it before, diversification is the way to go. I think the countries in Global North would, would do better for Africa and for East Africa by, by supporting, for example, seed development. And I'm, in this case, I'm not talking about maize seed alone, but informal and formal seed development and, and distribution networks for seeds, for main staples for Africa. And, and this would be very important. If today you see crop failure is basically because we didn't get enough seed, we didn't get fertilizer. The president of the chairman of the African Union today and the president of the African Union Commission are visiting Russia to meet with, with, with President Putin, mm -hmm. basically to discuss fertilizer, releasing fertilizer to Africa, opening the plug seaports for, 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 for grain to come to Africa because we've really been affected by what has happened in Russia as Africa. So you can imagine if we were able to produce part of this seed and fertilizer uh, manufactured and procured in Africa, this would be a slightly mm -hmm. different story. Thank you. Thank you very much. And with that, I would like to close the press briefing. Thanks for the great discussion. I'm really happy that we that we are shining a spotlight on this very important topic, which I think is not dealt with so much in European media. Um, thank you very much for the discussion and for the interesting points. And um, see you all soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.